So I want to welcome you to the fourth and final webinar in our series. And um, it's really good to see so many people on the call, and I'm hoping that you're going to enjoy it. If you're new to the webinars, I'd just like to introduce myself. I'm Jerry Friedman. I'm a mom, a grandma, and co-chair of ECA. And um, we've got basically two great presentations for you tonight. Uh, first, uh, there's two parts. And uh, what we're going to be doing is just having the first part. We'll have a short break and go into the second part. We'll, of course, have questions and answers. The first part of our um, webinar is you'll be hearing from Jen Chandler, who is our Director of Operations. And she's going to demonstrate and give you a tour of our new ECA website, which is going to give you all the tools you need to take action on a national level, on a local level, at the community level or state level. You've got all the tools there for you. And she's going to show you where they are, how to access them, and how to use them. After that, we've got a special guest, a world-renowned climate scientist, Catherine Hayhoe. And she will be speaking to us after the break. Moving along, Jen Chandler is the Director of Operations for Elders Climate Action. And for the past three years, she's been working to help us build our movement of elders who are committed to climate action. She's got a background in nonprofit management, visual arts, and education. And she is going to now give you her presentation. So please welcome Jen Chandler. Hi, everybody. It's great to be here. And I'm glad that so many people have joined us this evening on this webinar. And hopefully internet connection will stay strong through, through our thunderstorms and that we will um, not have any issues this evening. Um, I'm excited to share with you some of the resources that are available um, through Elders Climate Action. <clears throat> Um, we have a variety of really wonderful tools available on our website. We have a, a number of action tools that we've created for you um, to be able to take action from your own home or within your own community. And so tonight, I just want to introduce you to the format of the website, help you understand what information is available and what you can access when you get there. Um, our website is divided into three major sections. They are Get Inspired, Get Informed, and Get Engaged. The three th things that we feel we need to do um, or we need to create to help elders take action on climate change. So let's check out the website, www.eldersclimateaction.org. This is the homepage of the ECA website. When you get here, you'll notice that at the very top, there is a navigation menu. And again, it's broken into those three categories, get inspired, get informed, get engaged. You'll know what page you're on based on if the text is in purple or if it's in green. Right now we're on the homepage, so we're seeing it in purple. At the very top of the homepage, you'll also find our donate buttons, our join button, and our social media links. So if you'd like to join ECA, or you would like to make a donation, or you would like to link to our social media, you can find all of those links directly throughout the website at the top of our page. The ECA homepage, as you scroll down, looks something like this, although it often changes depending on what actions we have going on, um, what events are coming up, and so on. So right now we have ECA up, upcoming action events. This includes this webinar series that you're on, as well as um, our upcoming event in San Francisco, California, which is called Elders Awakened, Standing for Our Grandchildren and All Life. Um, in the, the next section, we see Take Action with ECA, and this is a section where you can link directly to specific actions that we have going on. So this is where you'll find the elders vote for the climate. This is where you'll find the candidates pledge um, links. And, and then also in the far corner, you'll see, or the far right of that box, you'll see um, our events section. And you can also click here to see all of our events that are happening um, at ECA. We also have a section climate news, which is articles, videos, uh, interviews, things like that, um, where ECA is highlighted or ECA members are interviewed 
um, so on. And then the last section that we're not showing here is a, a, a section about our newsletter and links to join our newsletter. If you go to the top navigation bar, you'll also, you can link on Get Inspired. Uh, when you click on Get Inspired, you see a uh, drop down menu. And in that drop down menu are the following things um, about us, who we are, ECA in action, voices of elders, and the voices of youth. So ECA in action is a great place to find out more information about Elders Climate Action Day in Washington, DC. It's a great place to find out more about uh, our first event in DC, which was Grandparents Climate Action Day, and some of the actions that ECA has been taking. Voices of Elders and Voices of Youth are sections where it's um, stories and, uh, and, and information shared um, from, directly from elders or from youth involved in the climate movement. So on the right hand side, you'll also see that there's a sub menu um, on the page that is the same information that you find in the drop down menu. So throughout the Get Inspired pages, any of the pages you're on, you'll see this sub navigation menu for the drop down. Let's take a little closer look at the Who We Are page. This is where you're going to see uh, the, the ECA leadership team. These are all the amazing, wonderful volunteers that make up Elders Climate Action, that make the leadership team of Elders Climate Action. All of you make the organization. Um, but these amazing people help lead the organization and really are taking a lead on climate action and really have the values of of preserving a livable future for their grandchildren. And um, all of them are very amazing humans and I have the pleasure to work with them. Um, if you're interested to find out more about these individuals, if you click on their photograph, it'll bring up a bio for each of those individuals. Also, Elders Climate Action is always looking for people to join the, the leadership team. We need people who are dedicated to making a difference for their grandchildren to help us build programming, um, uh, do social media, all sorts of things. So if you'd like to see your face on this page and add your bio to this page, um, join us and, and let us know that you're interested. The next section is the Get Informed section. This is where you can find a lot of information about um, ways that you can get in far or ways that you can share information from Elders Climate Action. So this is where you're gonna find the Action Toolkit, which is all the resources that we've created for you to use when you go out and do presentations or do events. We've also included a section called Climate Resources. Um, this section is a, a curated compilation of climate information that's out there um, where we wanted to bring it into one location where you can find it and it's make it accessible to you so we've got recommendations about organizations um, so on and so forth and we're going to look closer at the action toolkit the climate resources and the with your grandchildren sections of the get informed pages so that you know what tools um, you can find the Action Toolkit is our resource. It's sort of the one-stop shop for all things that you need, Elders Climate Action. And the various sections of the, the toolkit include the ECA newsletter, materials for events, info sheets and infographics. These are info sheets and infographics that Elders Climate Action has created, posters and banners, presentations. We have a section called Talking Climate with Others and uh, video and audio, audio recordings. So let's just take a closer look at some of those pages so you can see the resources that are available. Newsletters, you can find, read, or share previous ECA newsletters. Um, and these newsletters go back a couple of years. So there's, it's interesting to watch the changes of the organization and also just see the ways that we've been engaged over the years and the ways that, that the organization is um, growing and our membership is deepening their, their actions. Materials for events. These are the materials um, that we've created that you can print at home or you could download to a USB or to a flash drive and take to a printer or you could have printed um, from an online resource. Um, we've created sign up lists, flyers, uh, things 
things like that. We've created these I pledge um, half sheet pieces that people can write a, a pledge to the climate and take a picture of themselves and share on social media. Um, there's some really great resources here. And so if you click on the purple link below the image, that's how you can download that, um, that particular uh, image you're seeing above. We also offer some of the uh, flyers in black and white versions so that I know that printing costs can be expensive, keep our costs down. <clears throat> The info sheets and infographics page includes the info sheets that, that ECA has created, including what can you do about climate change, 10 ways to build engagement in your chapter, um, 10 simple ways to act for climate now. Um, we've also created a, an infographic about the clean power plan, which is, I think, um, a little apropos today in particular. Um, this this is a great little graphic that has been created that you can download and share it's a gif image so you can share it on social media you could send it to friends you could um, use it at your next presentation posters and banners i know with climate day of action coming up and i hope we're all going to be out taking action and i hope we're going to be trying to represent elders climate action while we're out there um, we've created a variety of posters and banners so on the left of, of the screen, you see a number of uh, posters that are able to, you can print from home. They print in eight and a half by 11, as well as 11 by 14 or tabloid size. Um, so these are posters that you can download and print from home, or if you don't have a printer, you can take to your local print shop and have them printed. If you, uh, are looking for banners for your next event. Maybe you're attending a march or a rally or, or something of the like. You can download our large banners and um, take those to your local print shop or take those to your, um, uh, or, or send it into it an online vendor to have printed out. Um, presentations. We have a number of slide presentations. Um, that that are we're hoping to add to those presentations as we go um, maybe you guys might have presentations that you're doing in your community that you might want to share with us that we can add to our resources um, there is a google slides version of the presentation that you can use there is also a powerpoint or pdf version of the power of the presentation and then there's some addi additional information about some of the particular slides or anything else that you might need to know Talking Climate with Others is a section that we've created to help you get more comfortable in talking with, with people um, about climate change, whether that is people in office or, or uh, candidates running for office or just even talking to your neighbors or your friends or people that you know from church. Um, we, wanted, we want to help you feel more comfortable um, in, in, in knowing what kinds of questions to ask and in knowing how to make, out, how to make contact with those people. So um, this page in particular, you can find sources like Ballotpedia, great resource to uh, find candidates running for office in your area. Uh, on, in the video and audio recording section, you will find all of the webinar series that you're on right now. So um, we see I, this slide is a little old, so it doesn't include uh, Nathaniel Sinet's talk from webinar three, but the webinar three is up on the website and um, all of the webinars will be posted to the website and as well as a number of other really great videos that we have um, including uh, other national calls that we've done and some promotional materials that we've created. So I want to show you a quick video. It's a, it's a two minute video. It's, we, it's, I refer to it as ECA in two minutes. And um, I hope that maybe you might take this video and share it to some of your networks. Oh, I forgot that I had some bullets there, sorry. You can also subscribe to ECA's YouTube channel um, to re receive automatic um, content updates too.
When I look into my grandson's eyes, I can see the brightness of his future, the promise of a better world. Yet when I look around me, I am deeply concerned by the rapid advances of climate change. Increased carbon in the atmosphere is creating instability we have never seen before. With more volatile and frequent storms and natural disasters, rising temperatures on land and in the ocean, ongoing air and water pollution, and so much more, these climate changes are causing dangerous risks to human health. What will his future be if I don't do anything? If we don't do anything? Elders Climate Action is a nonpartisan movement of elders committed to making our voices heard on climate change at the national and local level. With more than 90 million elders just in the United States, our movement draws upon a large population of voters with concerns for the environment and their individual legacies. As the largest voting bloc, elders are positioned to help create the political will to change our nation's energy policies while there is still time to avoid catastrophic changes in the Earth's climate. Join ECA and we will provide you with the tools and resources necessary to take climate action from the comfort of your own home and within your own community. Climate solutions do exist. We just need to support them with our voice, our vote, and our dollars. It is our responsibility to ensure a healthy and safe future for our grandchildren, their children, and their children's children. Join us and act now to protect future generations and all life at www.eldersclimateaction.org. So I hope you enjoyed that video. And I just want to remind you that you can um, use the Q&A section to ask any questions that you might have about any of the information as we um, go through this presentation. Um, the next section I really wanted to show you under the Get Informed heading is climate resources. And our climate resources section, um, again, is a curated collection from members of Elders Climate Action or the leadership team or individuals that have, have found content and shared it with us and, and we found it to be valuable and wanted to share it with you. So that section um, includes books, which you see on the left, and some suggested books and a short description of those books, um, climate articles, and reports, and these climate articles and reports are really great um, resources. I try to keep up with our policy committee um, who find a lot of really great reports out there, and I try to keep those um, posted as they, they suggest them. And if ever you run across information that you feel that would be valuable or read a book that you think other elders would be interested in reading, please share it with us and write up a short um, review or a short description and give us a link and we'll um, we'll see about adding it to the website. It's a great way to uh, find a lot of information that has already sort of been um, found for you. We've also discovered a lot of really great climate related infographics out there um, and, and use a number of these um, infographics in a lot of our presentations and things. So you can go to our climate related infographics page and you can download or link to a variety of infographics from a, a number of different organizations, including NASA, some of the NASA info, infographics. Um, our feature film section are films that have been um, watched or, or uh, reviewed by some of our um, members of Elders Climate Action and found that maybe you might be interested in seeing some of these um, or maybe you might be interested in hosting a book club or, or a movie night at your house and these are really great resources to help you figure out what information is out there um, and again if you see a movie and you think other elders would be interested in um, watching that movie send us a, send us some information about it 
Um, you can also link here on the future film section to watch an official trailer of those future films. So we're not giving you links to watch the future films because unfortunately we don't have that type of privilege, but um, you can link to at least see the, tra the trailers and see if it's something you might want to uh, rent or find maybe on some sort of outline, um, online streaming source. We've uh, curated a collection of climate related videos. Most of these are YouTube videos and um, have a few different sections of climate related videos, in, including um, pure inspiration with things like uh, Drew Dillinger reading or uh, doing his spoken word poem, um, Hieroglyphic Stairway, which is a elders climate action favorite. And if you haven't watched the video, I highly encourage you to watch it. Um, we also have the here you can see the do it now, um, sing for the climate um, link. So that's uh, the, the song that we use for our flash mob. So if you wanna uh, practice from home and as you scroll down the page, you'll find a few different sections that some of those videos are categorized into. Additional climate resources. This page is um, again, a lot of, of information curated um, by a lot of the members of our policy committee. Um, thank you, policy committee, for, for your hard work. And um, so they have spent a lot of time really looking at information that's out there. Um, at the very top of the page, you can see the Climate Solutions Caucus. Um, this is a caucus that's in the House of Representatives um, and links to Citizens Climate Lobby's website to find out more about the Climate Solutions Caucus. Um, as well as a number of other useful resources and action guides. Uh, a lot of organizations put out action toolkits. And <clears throat> so here's some links to some of those action toolkits that, um, that some of our members have looked through and found very helpful. We wanna make sure that you have all of the information and access to things that you need to really feel empowered and informed in being able to, to, to get engaged and take action. Um, one of my favorite sections, uh, especially to work on, is the With Your Grandchildren section. This is a great section that we have created that has includes videos, it includes um, books to read with your grandchildren, and it also includes um, online resources, so websites and, and curriculum guides and things like that, resources for teachers. Um, I really think that Multi, this is a multi-generational movement, Elders Climate Action. It's not just about elders, but we're doing it for the grandchildren. We're doing it for future generations. Let's um, share with the kids and let's learn together. Um, we, we recommend that you review all of the content and you make sure that it's age appropriate for your grandchild and the understanding of that child. But um, we hope that you're talking climate with your family members and, and with uh, your friends. <clears throat> the last section that we'll talk about is we'll do a quick um, overview of, get, of the Get Engaged section. This is really where you come to take action. This is where you come to find um, ways that you can participate. And so when you see the, the sub menu here or the drop down menu, you can see the, well, the webinar series that were on listed, the San Francisco events um, upcoming in California event uh, listed, the ECA national calls. Um, ECA chapters and our chapter directory. So if you're interested in finding out about, more about chapters um, or how to form a chapter in your area, if you're interested, uh, please click on those links. Events section, um, this is where you're gonna find upcoming webinars or upcoming uh, national calls, things like that, uh, climate team talk. And you'll find links directly to those calls. And then uh, our volunteer section. So where you can, you can fill out a form and let us know how you wanna participate and how you wanna be engaged. We're gonna take a quick look at um, a couple of those sections and those are the um, taking action section, the, the, the actions that we currently have um, in that section. And that is the candidates pledge climate action, um, elders vote for the climate 2018, sending letters to your representatives, and then the Dear Tomorrow uh, project, partnership project that we have um, called Letters to Loved Ones in 2050. 
If you're out and about doing things, let us know what you've been doing. Um, click here, you'll go to a Google form and you can give us a quick overview of some of the actions that you're out there doing and representing Elders Climate Action Act. Um, those knowing who's out and doing what and what our membership is up to is, is really important to us. So fill out this form, let us know what you've been doing. And then again, to the left, you'll see a quick link to the action toolkit. So if you're going to an event, you can get your materials. Um, the Candidates Pledge Climate Action is one of our actions right now. And in the, the box that you see highlighted in green, you can see the quick link to signing the Candidates Pledge. You can see the quick link to getting the email script for um, sending the, the email to candidates, ask, asking them to sign the pledge. And you can see who has signed the pledge um, on, on the, um, by clicking on that purple button. Elders vote for climate in 2018. Um, this is the partnership project we have with the Environmental Voter Project. And here you can see that the form is directly built into our website. So you can go in and you can sign the Environmental Voter Pledge um, or the Elders Vote for Climate Action Pledge right here on our website. And that information um, is shared between the Environmental Voter Project and Elders Climate Action. The Letters to Loved Ones in 2050 project is our partnership with Dear Tomorrow, um, which is a partnership where you can write letters to your loved ones in 2050 um, and letting them know what you did once you knew about climate change and the things that you've done to take action for their future. So you can submit your letter right here um, on the Elders Climate Action Letters to Loved Ones in 2050 page. And that, again, that letter gets shared between Dear Tomorrow and Elders Climate Action. And so this is a great opportunity um, to be part of a, a project that is going to be archived, a piece of history. These letters will be, um, will be held on to and re-released in, in 2050. Uh, so the future generations will get to hear about what we did once we knew about climate change. This is a really important project to tell the story um, so that we can we can make a difference. <clears throat> send a letter to loved ones, I mean, excuse me, um, send a letter to elected officials, a little different than loved ones. Um, we have a page that's dedicated to having a, a email templates. You can see uh, an email template here, elders urging members of Congress to take action on climate change. Um, and these are sign-on letters. We've, we've written a letter. You can add your own personal message to that letter and then just add your information and send it right off to your representatives. Our system figures out who your representatives are based on your address and, and sends it to um, whether you're sending to state officials or to federal representatives. We've got a number of different letter templates. Um, and so, and we're always adding to these letter templates. So um, let us know if you have an idea for a letter and we might be able to work on it. Social media is so important to social movements and we are essentially a social movement. We are a social movement trying to take action for the climate. And so Elders Climate Action has its own Facebook page but our chapters also have Facebook pages. So Ann Arbor, Arizona, NorCal, and Massachusetts all have Facebook pages. Um, so find them on Facebook, like their pages. And if you don't know about Facebook, I'm gonna give you a quick little overview of how to like our page. Um, if you go to Facebook, you'll see at the very top a search bar and you can search Elders Climate Action and then find us through that search bar. When you get here, you can click like our page, you can click follow our page, and you can also share our page directly with your friends um, on Facebook. You can also make a donation right through the Facebook page. If you're not familiar with Facebook, go to the Elders Climate Action website, and here you will find our Facebook 101 webinar, which I explained some of the basics to just using Facebook. How does Facebook work? And how do I post something? How do I like something? Those types of things, setting up an account. Um, so if you're not familiar with using social media, you might wanna give it a try. 
other forms of social media that we use at Elders Climate Action. We are on Twitter, we're on LinkedIn, we're on YouTube where you can subscribe to our channel and you'll see our content or you can also find through our website. And then um, word of mouth and forward to a friend. When you get our newsletter, make sure you forward it to a friend and make sure when you're out in your community, you're talking about elders climate action to people around you that might be interested. Um, don't be afraid to share our website. While you're um, out and about and, and when you get done with this webinar, I hope over the next few days, you might consider um, helping us grow telling 10 friends about Elders Climate Action, forwarding our, our, our newsletter, like I said, to 10 friends, um, ask 10 friends to follow us on Facebook, or share the website with, with 10 of your friends. But if each one of us took our time and shared ECA with 10 people, this movement could grow exponentially. And then we could really make some difference, um, I think, on climate change. Climate Tea and Talk is, um, is following this webinar. So we have an upcoming climate tea and talk. This is a great opportunity, um, Monday, August 27th, to join us to just have a casual conversation with elders, other elders, um, other members of, of Elders Climate Action, and talk about climate change, talk about what's happening in your own community, talk about some of the things that you're doing to take action. Um, there's no agenda to the call. It's just a casual, um, a casual conversation with like-minded individuals. So, um, or similar-minded, I should say. Um, so join us on Tea and Talk at 6 p.m. Eastern or 3 p.m. Pacific, and you will receive a link to the Tea and Talk in the webinar you received tomorrow evening following, um, with the uh, recording link following this webinar. And then last, um, I just wanna mention the ECA national call. Um, we are coming back with the ECA national call in September. We took a hiatus during the webinars, um, but we are coming back on September 25th. And we're really excited to be um, joined by Kia Chatterjee, um, who is the executive director of US Climate Act Action Network. Um, so join us, mark your calendars for Tuesday, September 25th. Our um, national calls are on the fourth Tuesday of every month at 7 p.m. Eastern. So you can just sort of circle that day on your calendar and plan to join us. Um, we always have somebody interesting and exciting to talk to you about um, what ECA is doing and what is happening out there in climate change. So thank you. And now I'll look at some of your questions and see if I can give you some answers. <clears throat> Let's see, I have a, if I want to communicate with ECA, how do I do that? Can I send an email? Is there a phone number? It's a really great, great question, and I apologize that if I didn't mention that earlier. Um, you can always email us at info at eldersclimateaction.org. Um, we don't currently have a phone number, so the best way to reach us is email. Uh, we are uh, I am the only staff member of Elders Climate Action, and all of the um, leadership team are diverse, diversely spread across the country. So, um, so yes, contact us at info at Elders Climate Action, and we will get right back to you. Um, another question I see is, how do I find out if there are other ECA uh, members in my area um, of the country so that we can connect? That's a really great question also. Um, the best way is let us know if you're interested in, in connecting. We have a link after these webinars on the, um, the follow-up uh, uh, email that you'll receive tomorrow. There's a link to a list where you can put your information on a Google Sheet um, that's shared between anybody who has access, access via that link. So um, that information, you can share your emails with one another if you wanna connect with other people who've been on the webinars. Otherwise, contact me at info at eldersclimateaction.org and I can send out an email to people in your area with your email address. We, we as a general rule, don't give email addresses out to anybody um, unless, it's, unless you are voluntarily sharing it, like the share list um, that you'll get tomorrow. 
Uh, let's see. I think the next question, who has developed all of these wonderful graphics? Um, well, thank you. That would be me. <laughs> um, our wonderful volunteers at Elders Climate Action are helping to develop all the content of these graphics. My background is in art. Um, and so I love to design things. And so um, it's a joy for me to get to do presentations like this. Um, let's see, we have another question. If I wanna get more involved, is there a way for me to find out what I could be doing? Um, I would suggest that if you wanna get more involved with Elders Climate Action, that you go to our website, you think about um, considering to volunteer for the leadership, uh, be, be a part of ECA National, and, um, and help us on different committees that we have. You might have some skills or, or some interests that fit well with one of our committees. Um, you can also take action through the taking action section of the website, sending a letter to members of Congress. Um, uh, we also are putting together a call script so you can make calls. So on, watch that for that on our next newsletter. You'll see um, links to a call script to make phone calls. Um, go do presentations at uh, community centers or at senior centers in your area. Attend events and um, wear, wear an ECA t-shirt if you have one. We've also recently got some buttons and so if you're attending the San Francisco event, you'll receive a button there or Massachusetts chapter members, you're going to, going to be receiving your buttons soon. Um, so find ways to talk about elders climate action out in your community. That's the biggest thing that's going to help build this movement. And really this movement is, is about engaging elders. The elders are the largest voting block in the United States. Elders make up 34% of the vote, at least in the last election. Um, el the voice of elders, when it comes to climate change, carries a huge amount of weight and power with it because it's, it's a group of people who largely vote, unlike other demographics. So we want elders to be involved. We want elders to be engaged in climate action, thinking about climate action, working on the Candidates Pledge Climate Action Project. Go get signatures on the Candidates Pledge from candidates in your area. Um, that's a great way. Ask other people to sign the voter pledge and pledge to be climate voters. And then lastly, the biggest thing that all of us can do right now this year is vote. So um, be informed and, and get out there and vote. Um, and, and I hope that you're asking questions of, cl of, of, about climate change and about climate action to any of the candidates that are running for office in your local area. <clears throat> Let's see, I have a question that says, do we need to have our own Facebook page to get involved with ECA's Facebook presence? Yes, David, unfortunately you do have to have a Facebook page in order to get into ECA's Facebook. So, um, that's part, of, that's part of the social media aspect. Um, is ECA seeking a spokesperson, an A-list, high publicity engagement, sustained support, um, not necessarily, uh, not, not expected financial? So I, um, I would say, yes, we're always seeking spokespeople. We would love to have some A-list, high publicity, um, person. I, I, I think that that would be phenomenal. So if any of you have connections or contacts to someone, you know, like a Leonardo, Leonardo DiCaprio or a Morgan Freeman or a Julia Roberts, let us know. And um, we would love to have anybody who wants to be a spokesperson out there, but someone that ha carries a, a little extra celebrity might just help uh, put Elders Climate Action on a larger map. Um, and so, yes, to that question. A uh, great question here. Do elders need, or do people need to be elders to get involved with elders climate action? What is the age requirement? I love this question. I like to say that elderhood is a state of being and a state of mind rather than an age. And so if you feel that you have wisdom or, or something to contribute to the climate movement, join us. Um, it is 
in my opinion, imperative that we take a, a multi-generational approach to solving climate change and to working together to take action on climate change. I uh, believe that grandchildren have a lot of power with their grandparents. So I hope that we can engage some younger membership to uh, help put some pressure on their parents, their grandparents, aunts, uncles, great, great, great grandparents, so on. Um, because Really, it's going to take all of us to change this pattern of human behavior that has created the reality that we're in right now. And I absolutely am convinced that we can change the trajectory, but it's going to involve us being educated and informed and engaged and out there, um, you know, empowering others to do the same and empowering others to use their voice, their vote, and their dollars to represent their values. Um, Let's see, uh, another great question. How do I become a member of Elders Climate Action? And are there dues or fees? Absolutely no dues or fees. Um, join our website, you will become a member of Elders Climate Action. And we hope that you'll be carrying our mission forward. You'll be out there in the community talking to people, um, sharing our information. But if, um, but if you would like to make a charitable contribution, and to help us continue to build this movement, we are always open and always welcome to do that. Um, and you can always make a charitable contribution in the honor of your grandchild. So um, make a contribution, write a short message to your grandchild, and we'll send them notification and let them know that you are trying to make a difference for their life and for their future. I don't see any other questions, so I'll give you a one last minute to see if you have any more questions. Otherwise, I think I'll turn it back over to Jerry. So, Jerry, to you. Thank you so much, Jen. That was absolutely wonderful, packed with information. And I'm hoping that now you can see all that is available to you on the website. Um, if you've got questions, send questions to info at eldersclimateaction.org. But um, we're there to support you if you've got ideas for other, um, other pieces of uh, information that would be helpful to you, then let us know. And um, right now, what we're going to do is we're going to take a short break. It is... All right, welcome back. Um, we are honored tonight to have Catherine Hayhoe uh, speak with us. And I just would like to just, for those of you who don't know her history, give you a little in introduction. Uh, Catherine is an accomplished climate scientist with over 120 peer reviewed publications in the top journals in the field. She's also a remarkable communicator. Recognized by Time Magazine as one of the top 100 most influential people in the world, not in the country, but in the world, by foreign policy as one of the top 100 global thinkers and by Fortune Magazine as one of the 50 world's greatest leaders. She has served on panels for the National Academy of Science, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and many other professional organizations devoted to understanding and communicating climate change. As a world-class climate scientist and a Christian, Dr. Catherine Hayhoe may defy some stereotypes about the politics of religion and science, but by defying Stereotypes invites inquiry, which can lead to communication, even learning. It creates opportunity for thinking deeply about and aligning what we value and what we do. Climate change is a huge issue, and it's one where citizen engagement is critical. That's why her work is so fascinating, in part because it's about climate change, and also because her main theme, faith and science, defies stereotypes. So now I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Catherine Hayhoe, and um, welcome her to this presentation. Thank you, it's great to join you here today. Uh, let me just share my screen here. So I'm gonna talk about climate change from maybe a little bit of a different angle. I am a climate scientist, this is what I do. I specifically look at how the different choices that we might make over coming decades will affect our future. But what I've learned through talking to thousands of people around the United States and really around the world is that more facts and figures about heat flux and cloud types 
that's not what's going to change people's minds. Because when we think about climate change, we have to think about something that actually matters to us. Otherwise, why bother? There's so many things today to be worried about. It's hard to prioritize. And often climate change seems like the last thing on our list. Because when you poll people and you say, what's the number one symbol or picture that you would associate with the changing climate? Just think for yourself here in your head, what picture, if somebody said global warming or climate change to you, what picture would you pull up in your head? For most people, the picture that they would pull up in their head is this. A polar bear usually standing on a piece of ice that's melting. But the reality is, is that most people have never seen a polar bear in the wild. So if the number one symbol of this issue is an animal that they have never seen before with their own eyes in the wild, then why should they care about it? If we put a human face on climate change, until recently that human face has typically been people who live very far away. People who live on low-lying islands in the South Pacific that are being flooded as sea level rises. But usually not people who live in our communities, who we might know, um, who are being affected by a changing climate. That's why I'm firmly convinced that one of the most dangerous myths that the largest number of people have bought into is not the myth that the science isn't real. Now you might say, hang on, but Catherine, don't you? Yes, I do every day. I know exactly what people are saying about the science of climate change. But I also know that those number of people, even though they're very loud, are actually a much smaller group than the number of us who've bought into this myth, the myth that climate change is a distant issue. It only really affects either future generations or people who live very far away from me. Now, because I'm a scientist, I want to show you this using the data. I'm going to start with this map, and this is a wonderful map from the Yale Climate Opinion Maps. You can find it yourself if you just Google Yale Climate Opinion. And they have these maps for Canada as well, although they didn't ask quite as many questions for Canada. And they've even done a bit of work in Europe too. So these maps are for the US and they show public opinion by county here. Each little box there is a county. They ask people, do you think global warming is harming animals? And anything that is orange is above 50% and the darker orange it is, the more people say yes. Well, it turns out pretty much everybody in the US would agree that global warming is harming animals. Okay, polar bear, check. Then they said, do you think global warming will harm future generations? Everybody says yes. So they think it's going to harm the polar bear and they think it's going to harm people who live in the future. But then they said, do you think global warming will harm people in developing countries? And you know, most people still said yes. And then they said, do you think it will harm people who live in the United States? See the difference there? Let me just take you back developing countries, future generations, in the United States now or in the next 10 years. All of a sudden, the map is blue. What does that mean? It means that people might agree it's going to affect plants and animals and people in developing countries and future generations, but they don't think it's going to affect us in the places where we live. And it doesn't stop here. They asked one more question. They said, do you think it is going to affect how can we get closer to home? You. And this was the answer. Now, if you're wondering who lives in those few orange counties that I can see, there's some orange counties in northern New Mexico and southern Texas. Who lives in those counties? The most concerned people group about a changing climate in the entire US lives in those counties. You know who the most concerned people are about a changing climate in the US? Hispanic Catholics. Now you might say, oh, well, that's because of the Pope, right? You know who's the least concerned people group in the US? White Catholics. And that shows us that this is not a religious issue. It is not a scientific issue. It is an issue of political polarization, saying that it does not matter to us. This is a more recent summary that goes all the way up to 2018. It was conducted by Gallup, and they've been do doing this since 2000, so almost 20 years. 
This is a summary of what people think. Turns out that most people agree that scientists believe global warming is occurring, and we do. Uh, most people actually agree global warming is caused by human activities, 64%. 60% uh, believe the effects have already begun, which they have. But then look at the last two questions. Do you think global warming will pose a serious threat in your lifetime, 45%? Do you worry about it, 43%? That's where the issue is. The issue is not up above, the issue is down below. So again, one of the most dangerous myths I'm convinced that we've bought into is that it is a distant issue. It only matters to people who live far away or future generations, and even more, if it ever becomes a problem, somebody else will take care of it for me. Now, this myth is starting to shatter because when we read the news and we read that, you know, regulations on coal are being rolled back, tariffs are being slapped on solar panels, the U.S. Withdrew, is going to withdraw from the Paris Agreement, it's starting to dawn on most of the people in the middle, which is actually where most people are, that no, nobody is going to fix this for us. We have to do it ourselves. And that takes me to my darkest blue map. You thought the previous one was bad? This is the darkest blue one. This is where they ask people, do you ever talk about it? And they don't. Look at this. Hardly anybody ever talks about it. What can we say when we talk about it? This is kind of how I feel as a climate scientist when I find out that nobody talks about this issue that affects everybody at this time in this country. Why does it matter? I think we have to start with this question. Why does climate change even matter? Because for many of us, we say, oh, well, of course it matters. But why? We have to be able to articulate why it matters to people. You can't just tell someone you should care, you ought to care, you better care. We have to be able to understand fundamentally ourselves why it matters. And then we have to be able to share that with others. So why does climate change matter? We get floods naturally. And I'm gonna show you a few pictures all from Texas all the last couple of years. We get floods naturally. We get hurricanes naturally. We get droughts naturally. We get record-breaking fires naturally. This is just part of life on this planet. And this is what our brains are built to remember. Our brains are built to remember the ups and the downs, the record cold and heat, the record wet and dry. That's what our brains are built to remember. But what we don't often think about is the fact that our entire civilization is not built on remembering the coldest day of the year or the wettest day of the year. Our civilization, and by that I mean our energy resources, our water resources, our agriculture, our building codes, our infrastructure, our economy, our national security, it's built on the assumption that we can have highs and lows and ups and downs and crazy weather and normal weather, but it all averages out in the end, such that what happened over the last 30, 50, 100 years is a perfect predictor of what's gonna happen in the future, and we can plan accordingly. What type of planning is built on this assumption of a stable climate? What type of houses we build? Where and how? How much energy they need? What type of crops we grow and when and where? How do we draw our flood zones based on past climate? How do we plan for the future of our water? Looking at how much water we've had in the past. This is built into the fabric of our society because we've had a remarkably stable climate over the course of human civilization. Yet today, climate is changing faster than any time that we've seen in human civilization. And that is why it matters. Was it warmer back in dinosaur times? Yes. But did we have two thirds of the world's biggest cities within a few feet of sea level? No. We care about a changing climate because there's seven and a half billion people on the planet. And we have built that civilization that supports us with our food, our water, our resources, our infrastructure, on the assumption that climate is stable. Not only that, but we've created safety nets. We've created insurance. We have government assistance during disaster. We even have National Guard or the Army to help out when there's disasters. But increasingly, these safety nets are getting overwhelmed. 
Farmers Insurance sued the city of Chicago a couple of years because it couldn't keep up with the flood damages because they had accelerated so much because of a changing climate. And they said the city had to do something about it. FEMA, under uh, President Obama, started to require every single state to account for how the risks were changing due to climate change. And they had to do this in order to get FEMA disaster relief. Because otherwise, you could just be saying, oh, well, I'm just going to go with the old flood zones that we had. Well, you know what? Houston had 300, three 500 year flood events before Harvey in three years. The old flood definitions don't work. And if we're using them, we're going to end up having emergencies a lot more frequently than we used to. The way I think of it is kind of like driving down a road in Texas. This is where I live in Lubbock, Texas. And the roads are so straight here because it's so flat, that you could drive a ways up this highway here that you can see in, in the orange arrow. You could be driving a ways up this highway, staying not just on the road, but in the same lane, looking in the rear view mirror. Why? Because the road is so straight that where you were five seconds ago, 15 seconds ago, a minute ago, is a perfect predictor of where you'll be in the future. But just before you get to Plainview, Texas, which is just off the top of the map, just before Plainview, there's a giant curve in the road. And if you're driving north, looking in the rearview mirror and you get to that curve, I think we all know what's going to happen. In the same way, planning for the future based on the past is like driving down the road looking in the rearview mirror. It works great if climate is stable and the road is straight. But if there's a curve in the road, we have to look ahead and prepare for a changing climate. Otherwise, we will run off the road. And today, we are already on that curve and our wheels are already on the rumble strip. So here's our assumption of a, of a changing climate. We still get our variability. We still get our ups and downs, heat and cold, wet and dry, extremes in both directions. But the frequency and the risk of many of those is changing. We care about a changing climate because our, our society and our civilization is built on the assumption of a stable climate. And as climate changes, it is making all of our infrastructure and our water planning and our agriculture unsuited to the plans we've made, but it's also exacerbating many of the risks that we face. One of the first ways that we are already seeing climate change affect us today is through taking the weather and climate disasters that occur naturally already and amping them up or exacerbating them. This is a map created, I, I don't have a similar map for other countries. I'm trying to get the data to make one for Canada. This is a map for the US though, showing the number of disasters that have cost at least a billion dollars worth of damage since 1980. Now, why is Texas number one? It's number one because naturally speaking, we get everything. We get hurricanes and droughts and dust storms and haboobs. We get winter storms, believe it or not, we do, and hail and blizzards and windstorms and heavy rain events. We get pretty much everything in Texas naturally. So why do we care about a changing climate? It's because it's increasing the risks, it's amplifying them. So let's take Hurricane Harvey for an example. Would Hurricane Harvey have occurred 100 years ago without, you know, before climate had changed very much? The hurricane itself, yes. The hurricane itself probably would have occurred 100 years ago. But would it have been so strong? No. Would it have moved so slowly? No. Would it have been so big? No. Would it have broken so many rainfall records? Absolutely not. In fact, we know, now know that about 40% of the rain that fell during Hurricane Harvey, 40% was the result of a warming planet. In other words, if you had a Hurricane Harvey 100 years ago, it would have only had 60% of the rain. And you know, in some places they got 50 inches. Imagine the difference between 30 inches of rain, which is still quite bad, and 50 inches of rain, which is devastating. That's why we care about a changing climate. It's not creating new risks we've never seen before. It's taking the risks that we're familiar with and it's amplifying them. It's putting them on steroids. It's making them stronger and stronger and increasing the risks and the damages associated with them. 
when it happens in a place like Houston, the National Guard rolls out, the insurance companies kill, kick in, the repairs get started immediately as soon as the storm goes. But when it hits a place like Puerto Rico, three months after Hurricane Maria hit Puerto Rico, half the island did not even have electricity. It ripped through some Caribbean islands and left them entirely devastated. Dominica was uninhabited for a while. So this raises an even more important issue. The more vulnerable we already are today, the more vulnerable we are to a changing climate. Those who already have the least today are those who have the most to lose in the future. And that's not really fair. This is what I mentioned before. This is the, the farmer's insurance suing the city of Chicago for failing to prepare for a changing climate. And then of course, it seems like the headlines every day are talking about last year was the warmest year on record. This fire was the largest wildfire ever. I should note that the Thomas wildfire is not the largest fire. It, that record has been broken two times since that headline came out eight months ago. Things are changing very quickly to the point where the Prime Minister of Dominica, when he was speaking to the United Nations after the hurricane season last year, he said, to deny climate change is to deny a truth that we have lived. Climate change is no longer a future issue. Today, we have finally gotten to the point where no matter where we live, we can point to something that is happening that affects us and the places where we live in a way that actually matters to us. And the number one way we can do that is by showing how climate change is amplifying the risks of what used to be naturally occurring events, whether droughts, heavy rainfall events, heat waves like we saw this summer, or stronger hurricanes. As John Holdren, who was the former president's science advisor said, how do we respond to this? We have three choices. We can reduce our emissions, that's mitigation, our carbon emissions from burning coal and gas and oil is what's driving this problem. We can reduce our carbon emissions, we can prepare for a very different future, that's adaptation, or, and this is not a very sciencey word, or we can suffer. We are going to do some of each. The question right now is simply what the mix is going to be. Because the more mitigation we do, the less adaptation will be required and the less suffering there will be. So what do these three things look like? If these are our choices, and if we are going to do some of each, but we want to make sure we do as much mitigation as we can so the adaptation is successful to minimize the suffering, what do each of these three things look like? Let me give you some examples. These are just examples. I could give an entire, in fact, actually, I do give an entire course on this. Uh, next semester, I teach a course that's primarily for students in public administration, and it talks all about what we can do to mitigate and to adapt to prevent suffering. So for 10 minutes now, you're gonna get a summary of an entire semester's worth of material. And as you can see, this is where I get really excited because when we see people doing something, that's what motivates us to do something too and to care. So when we talk about climate change, rather than talking about all the doom and gloom that we see in the science, which unfortunately we do, once I start talking about what we see happening here in adaptation and mitigation, that's where we can start to connect with people and that's where the message starts to really resonate. So what does adaptation look like, for example, in Chicago? Why did I pick Chicago? It's because Chicago was one of the very first cities that I ever worked with. It's been 10 years now since we developed customized climate projections for the city of Chicago, and we use them to look at 110 different ways that temperature and precipitation could affect the city of Chicago. Everything from great lake levels to uh, beaches flooding to wastewater treatment plants overflowing to what happens to the Chicago Transit Authority. Let me show you some of the things that we did and some of the ways that the city is responding. The first thing we did was to identify the risks. How do we identify the risks? We asked the people who already knew what those risks are, and they're not the climate scientists. They're the people who work in that area every day. Yesterday, I met with Texas corn producers. They're the ones who know the risks, and so I spent a lot of time asking them what types of situations they had dealt with, and I learned a lot about 
how disease overwhelmed a number of their crops last year because it was very warm, but also very rainy. And when it's warm and rainy, disease runs rampant. I didn't know that. With Chicago, there's all kinds of things I didn't know about Chicago, even though I actually went to graduate school in Illinois. Flooding is endemic. I didn't know that. I didn't know that they already have a problem where they have to shut down the Metra train when it gets too hot because the rails warp. And then when we were talking about this, the city made re uh, representatives from 18 different departments sit down in this room together to talk to us about it. And you could tell some of the people were wondering why they were there. Like the Department of Emergency Response was like, surely we have more important things to be doing, like saving people's lives than sitting here listening to this climate scientist. But after we started talking and the CTA said, well, our rails warp when it gets over 94 degrees. Can you give us projections decade by decade by decade of how many days per year on average? Of course, some years are warmer, some are colder. But on average, can you tell us how many days per year we'll have over 94? Because then we'll know by when we should start replacing our rails ahead of time to minimize the amount of, of money we'll have to put into shutting down the rail and busing people. So we said, yeah, we, we can give you that information. We can't tell you the temperature on July 18, 2032. But we can absolutely tell you on average in the 2020s, 2030s, 2040s, how many days you'll have over 94. So then the emergency response people said, can you tell us the number of days per year over 96? And I said, yes, yes, we can do 96 too. Why? They said, well, because we staff by the thermometer. The south side of Chicago, which is, uh, has hardly any trees, there's a lot of people in very poor condition there who cannot afford to pay their air conditioning, um, and when it gets really hot out, they're afraid to open their window. They said, when the temperatures soar, the call, the emergency calls soar too. Health problems, people's tempers soar. There's all kinds of issues associated with that. We could do that. It turned out that out of the 18 departments that originally came into that small windowless conference room in downtown Chicago that one day, 14 of them identified at least one, some of the many, different ways that their operations or their maintenance were affected by a changing climate. From the natural gas and the air conditioning that the public school board used, to the types of trees they plant in their parks. They're now planting trees that are native to Southern Illinois in Chicago parks, because when those trees reach maturity, they will be at the climate of Southern Illinois. And we got that information for them. The, the Chicago Metro, as I, as I said, they currently even run cooling trains on the L where they spray water on the tracks to cool it down in, some, in summer. They have a plan now to replace those rails. We looked at pothole formation from freezing and thawing and freezing and thawing. If you've ever been to Chicago, you know potholes are a terrible problem there. And we looked at all kinds of things, even the fact that some of their summer festivals, which they're famous for, which bring in a lot of tourist revenue, might have to be moved to earlier in the year so they didn't occur when it was really incredibly hot and humid outside because when that happens, attendance drops and they actually lose a lot of money. One of the biggest issues in Chicago is flooding, but flooding is not easy to deal with. So we developed the projections for them, but it wasn't until I was giving a presentation about four years later and I thought to myself, well, what have they done about flooding? I don't know what they've done. I haven't heard anything. So I Googled it. And that same week I Googled it, there were these two news stories. New sewers quickly dispatch heavy rains and massive new reservoir to help alleviate Chicago area flooding. It takes a couple of years to get these type of initiatives underway. It was four years after we actually developed the projections that they made this happen, but it's amazing that they can do this. And because they've done this, their city is more resilient and more prepared for a changing climate. And one of the most interesting things they did was we looked at heat waves. Back in the 1990s, there were two devastating heat waves that killed hundreds of people in Chicago. Chicago is very sensitive to the fact that the urban heat island effect magnifies the influence of a heat wave. So, you know, cities are much warmer than the surrounding rural area because all the dark surfaces trap heat. And then even at night, the buildings are giving off heat. And so what Chicago decided to do was they decided that they were going to take their own microclimate into their own hands and they were going to lower the urban heat island effect of their city by the same amount that climate change was pushing it up. 
How? Green roofs, tree planting, more reflective surfaces. So that as climate changes, as it gets warmer due to changing climate, Chicago is actually lowering the temperature of its urban heat island effect so it won't see that many changes in the city itself. Isn't that incredible what people can do to adapt? It absolutely blows your mind, but you have to know what's happening. You have to take your eyes off the rear view mirror and you have to look ahead down the road to see what's happening in order to be able to prepare. So those are just a couple of adaptation examples that get me really excited. Right now I'm working with Austin in Texas. I worked with Washington DC a couple of years ago. Um, we're also looking at the province of Alberta and Canada. I'm helping all of these people look down the road and prepare for a change in climate. But we also need to consider mitigation because our adaptation is only successful if we also mitigate. If we allow emissions to continue unchecked, there's no adaptation in the world that's gonna help us um, reduce and eliminate the suffering associated with those changes. So what does mitigation look like? For mitigation, the example I picked here is Texas. Why? Because Texas has some of the highest greenhouse gas emissions per capita in the country. Texas, yes, is one of the worst emitters. So you might say, okay, well, but aren't you gonna give us a, yes, I am. There are incredible things happening in Texas, let me tell you. Texas has the biggest military base in the US, it's called Fort Hood, it's in Killeen, Texas. Last year, they were looking for a new contract to supply their electricity. They got all the bids in and they took the cheapest bid. The cheapest bid was not natural gas. It was wind and solar and it saves taxpayers over $160 million in Texas. Every spring in Texas, there's new records being broken. We're currently on average, after 2017 finished, we're up to about 20% power. And we even have entire towns in Texas going with clean energy. The reason why this town here, Georgetown, Texas, which is just north of Austin, the reason why they went with green energy was not because of a bunch of environmental groups. It was because three business students from the local college for a project for their class figured out how much the city could save if it got its own energy source, looked at the different costs of all the energy, realized that wind and solar is actually cheaper in Texas now than natural gas, it is, went to city council, showed them how much money they could save, and they made a very financially prudent decision, which, by the way, also happens to reduce their carbon emissions. Now, people always say, when you start talking about, you know, what about mitigation, that one of the favorite things people say, and I hear this almost every week is, yeah, but we could reduce our emissions to meet the Paris Agreement or even further, but it wouldn't even matter because China's building a new power, coal fired power plant today. They used to be, but they're not anymore. They're shuttering coal plants in China now. They've turned off the last coal fired power plant that supplies Beijing a couple of months ago. China now has more wind and solar energy than any other country in the entire world, and India is not far behind. So when we talk about mitigation, I love talking about what's happening in Texas and California and how Rhode Island has the first offshore wind turbine farm in the country and how Iowa is, I think they're like 37% wind or something like that too. But in addition to that, I like talking about what's happening in other places that you wouldn't expect. The fact that China is spending billions of dollars on clean energy. The fact that we have incredible technology. We have solar shingles, but we also have solar panels. And in Sub-Saharan Africa, where about 700 million people do not have electricity today, pay-as-you-go solar is one of the ways that is electrifying those rural areas faster than anything else. Don't you love that picture? We can talk about what personal mitigation looks like, whether it's a plug-in car. I got a plug-in car last year, and for the first couple of weeks, we had it plugged in outside our house. Now, I live on a cul-de-sac in Texas, and all of our neighbors drive these giant Yukons. And, you know, when, when someone passes you as they're driving by, they wave out the window. They don't roll down the window. The window's up because the air conditioning's on. They just wave. So we had this car plugged in outside the house, 
and every single neighbor stopped, got out of their car, walked over if we were standing there and said, what is that? We said, well, it's an electric car. And they said, does it have a gas pedal? We said, yes. Would you like to look at it? Yes, I would love to look at it. And then we talked about how much it costs to charge it and how far you can drive on it. And the fact that because we live in Texas, I got one that has a gas tank too, not a Tesla. So you can switch over if you need to. And where did you get that? And then for a couple of times afterwards, whenever the car was parked outside, as they drove by, they would roll down the window and they'd lean out and they'd say, I love your car. Those are the types of conversations we can have, even in Texas. And of course, we can talk about things like light bulbs. We can talk about all kinds of things. Mitigation today looks like everything from crazy new technology to super old stuff and everything in between. But the bottom line though is that our future really is in our hands. And this is the type of work I do. I look at the difference between a high carbon future and a low carbon future. And the difference is stark and the difference is primarily due to the choices that we make in mitigation. It really is up to us. So lastly, what does suffering look like around the world? Well, we know what that looks like, but let me give you a couple of examples specifically related to a changing climate. This is a map that shows where those people live who are most vulnerable to a changing climate. And as we've already talked about, those people live in the places where they have the least. People who already suffer from hunger or poverty or disease or lack of access to clean water, they are the people who are most vulnerable to a changing climate, both here where we live as well as in other countries around the world. Here where we live, the suffering associated with the changing climate looks like what we see happening on the Gulf Coast and the East Coast when climate change is supercharging our hurricanes creating much more damaging impacts than they would have had 50 or 100 years ago. In the Arctic, it's thawing what used to be permanently frozen ground. There's over 200 Native American villages in Alaska alone, let alone the rest of the Arctic, that are at imminent risk. Who said that? The Army Corps of Engineers, 10 years ago. Yet only one of those villages has managed to move. The monsoon is a natural part of life in Southeast Asia, but a warming ocean and all of the extra water that evaporates as the planet warms is supercharging the monsoon to the point where last September, a year ago from now, over one third of the entire country of Bangladesh was underwater. And this week, Kerala, India suffered from devastating floods. Is the monsoon normal and natural? Absolutely. Is this amount of rain associated with the monsoon normal and natural? No. Climate change is exacerbating these natural risks, making them worse and worse. That's what suffering looks like. Syria. We're all familiar with the Syrian refugee crisis. Was it caused by a changing climate? No, it wasn't. It was the result of all kinds of factors all coming together. Refugees kept pouring in from the Iraqi war over the last decade a very corrupt political system, religious and civil tensions, all of that piled together and then there was the icing on the cake. A record-breaking drought that was two to three times more likely as a result of a changing climate. That record-breaking drought did not cause the refugee crisis, but it was one more straw on top of the already overloaded camel's back that drove over a million farmers to abandon their land move into the cities, unemployment rates skyrocketed, contributing to civil tension and unrest, exacerbating the crisis to the point where it tipped it over the balance. That's what suffering looks like. The reason why I care about a changing climate is because it's kind of like this bucket. We already care about hunger and poverty and disease and people dying of waterborne illnesses, millions of them every year, most of them under the age of five. We care passionately about these things and we're pouring our, our, our money, our time, our hope, our prayers, our effort, everything we can into this bucket to try to fix the immense suffering that is already occurring today in the world. Yet there is a hole in that bucket and that hole is climate change. The reason why I care about a changing climate is because there's the hole in the bucket of all the other things that I would like us to fix. That's what we have to be able to communicate to people.
So when we talk about climate change, it isn't about the polar bear, although the polar bear is affected. It isn't only about people in low-lying islands in the South Pacific, although they are certainly affected. It's about people everywhere who are looking at increased risk of water shortages, impacts on their food and their security, looking at national security implications, looking at the economic impacts of a changing climate. All of these together are affecting us today. And that is why we care. So the bottom line is this. The bottom line is to care about a changing climate, it isn't just a matter of the science. It isn't just a matter of the traditional ways that we've thought about a changing climate, you know, that it affects uh, people far away or future generations or polar bears. The reality is, is that we care about a changing climate because it is affecting all of us today. And so what I'd like to do to close is I'd like to share the words of one of my favorite scientists with you. And she said this only a couple of years ago after a long career um, in science. It's Jane Goodall, and she said this. It's only when our clever brain and our human heart work together in harmony that we can achieve our full potential. I think this holds true more than anything to a changing climate. It isn't just about our head and all the facts and data we know. It's about connecting all of that information to why we care about people. Thank you. Now, before I take any questions, which we absolutely are gonna do since I think we have time, right? Let me just give you two resources before I take any questions. Um, resource number one, if you want any more on the climate science, this is the uh, most up-to-date report and summary of climate science in the world today, as far as I know. It just came out last November. I was one of the lead authors. You can find it at science2017.globalchange.gov, and there's nice summaries at the beginning of every chapter. I also did a webinar just a few weeks ago on this, um, this report. So if you'd rather listen to me talk again for another 45 minutes about climate science, um, this is what the webinar looks like. And if you just Google my name, hey ho, and climate science, what's new, you'll be able to find this on YouTube and watch it. And then lastly, if you're interested, I also have this little series called Global Weirding on YouTube. They are short videos, only five to seven minutes long, about frequently asked questions that people have about climate change. Um, now, they're, they're not actually cartoons. They're mostly me talking, but we do have some cartoons, and that's why we put a cartoon on the cover of each one. But they ask questions like, you know, my favorite, I'm only a kid, what can I do about climate change? Or how long have we known about this whole thing? Or if I just explain the facts, surely they'll change their mind, right? Or the Bible doesn't talk about climate change, does it? So if you're interested in more, check out our global weirding videos. All you have to do to find them is just Google global weirding and they'll pop right up on YouTube. Or you can look at our climate science report and the webinar that I did if you want more on the science. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was wonderful and tons of information. And we do have some questions, so I'm glad you're going to be able to have some time to stay with us a few more minutes. Um, the first question is about China. Um, one of our, our participants is asking, um, is China moving into building coal plants internationally? They've heard about them trying to build a plant in Uganda where the community resisted so much that they moved it to Latin America. Mm -hmm. um, are you familiar with that? So not that specific example, but I am familiar with, unfortunately, the terrible hypocrisy that China is shutting down its own coal-fired power plants because it knows the devastating toll that it has on people's health. And they're actually in China, they're flooding old open pit coal mines with water and they're putting floating solar panels on the top of them. And they are leading in wind and solar development, but the bottom line is they wanna do whatever makes money. And unfortunately in some places, rather than bring in the new technology that they have access to themselves in their own country, they are still trying to go with old technology in other places. Like, and it's basically, it's like trying to install, um, you know, phone wires when everybody already has cell phones. That's why I think technology transfer is so important because some of the cheapest solar prices in the world today, they're not in the United States, I can tell you that. They're in uh, Peru and Mexico and uh, India. So things are changing very quickly, 
But unfortunately, when you have coal and you don't want to burn it, so you want to force somebody else to burn it, that's what's happening with China and with the U.S. too. Wow. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Um, we have another question. How can we get our own cities and counties to plan for climate change, especially if we're in a poor rural area and acknowledging that we're elders? Yes. Um, I feel as if elders have more weight often than the younger voices because too often it's many of the young people who are advocating for change. And in my experience, um, as I am now kind of a mid, mid aged person rather than younger, I have been patted on the head a lot. I have been told, oh, you're so cute and you're so sweet, but you don't know what you're talking about. When you're my age, you'll understand the world is a more complicated place. You don't have that problem. And because you don't, you can use it to say, I have lived here for this long and draw on your experience. This is what I have seen in the place where we have lived. I have seen these types of things impact our people and our economy. I have seen these concerns that we have and these issues we need to address. But then most of all, come in with a solution. I have looked at it and I have talked to people and here are some ideas that we could implement that would benefit us, and this is really important, for multiple reasons. Let me give you a, an example here in Texas. There's many small rural communities here in Texas that have lost their tax base and they've lost their young people. If you can't afford to pay for a decent doctor, decent teachers at the school, a playground for the kids, people don't wanna stay there to raise their families and if there's no jobs, even less. But today, wind technician is the fastest growing job in the entire United States. It has been for four years now. And they are putting in giant wind farms all over Texas. And so all of a sudden, there's this huge demand for younger people who have technical training to do maintenance on wind farms in all these small rural communities. And I've heard stories of some communities in our area where their tax base has increased by a factor of 10 after a wind farm came in. And all of a sudden, people's kids are coming back because you have the tax money you need now to upgrade the school, to pay for more teachers, to get the playground for the kids. And so you, you've grown the local community, you've built resilience, but you're also mitigating at the same time. There should always be multiple reasons for everything we propose. Doing something because of a changing climate that hurts us is never gonna fly. We have to think of the reasons why it benefits us. Thank you. We have another question. In light of Pope Francis, and how is it possible that white Catholics were the least concerned about climate change in the service that you ref in the survey you referenced? And where was what's the origin of that survey? Yes, the survey is from um, the American Association of Religion, and white evangelicals, I will say, are just just a hair above white Catholics in terms of the people who care the least. And, but everybody reads the same Bible. And the Bible states very clearly in Genesis that humans are given responsibility or stewardship or dominion over this earth. And it states very clearly in Revelation that God will destroy those who destroy the earth. And there's many verses in between that talk about loving and caring, not just for nature or creation, but loving and caring for people, especially people who are poor and suffering. So it isn't our theology that is causing us to, to believe what we do. When you actually look at the, at the social science of what makes people think what they do, the number one predictor of whether people think climate is changing and humans are responsible and we should do anything about it, the number one predictor is simply where we fall in the political spectrum. The more conservative we are, the less likely we are to, to agree with the science because we've been told that the person we are who we are as a person is not somebody who agrees with all of that liberal stuff. Thank you, thank you so much. We have a couple more questions if you're still good and have a couple more minutes. Mm -hmm. um, this starts out with saying thank you so much. This has been a very helpful introduction to ways we can address climate change, particularly at the local level. Do you have any suggestions for our members around the country about how to identify the mitigation and the adaptation actions they can push for? Mm -hmm. Great question. So there are a lot of resources for cities. There's a couple of different, there's the C4 cities, there's the, um, 
uh, what's the other city organization? There's a lot of different city organizations and they're not all big cities. They're not all, you know, New York, Chicago. So there's a lot of little cities too. Even Greensburg, Kansas, the one that was devastated by the tornado a couple of years ago, they rebuilt green and went with green energy too, which is really interesting. So my, my best advice to you would be is to look for a city or a region of similar size and similar characteristics who are doing some really interesting things and just call them up and say, hey, what are you doing? How are you doing it? What are the pros and the cons? Get some real world examples. And if you're looking for any help, um, you're welcome to email me through my website, just katherinehayhoe.com, and I'm happy to try to help you find them if you can't. But that's really the best thing to do because so many people are doing things today that having that real world example is incredibly helpful. In terms of adaptation though, so that's for mitigation. In terms of adaptation, the number one thing to do, and I've done this with many cities, big and small, for a long time now, is to sit down and to say, how have we been impacted by any type of climate or weather issue in the last two or three decades? How have we been impacted? So for example, have we had some really serious summer heat that put a stress on our power grid? Or had some very negative impacts on our health? Was there a lot of admissions to the hospital? Have we had some really um, severe rainstorms that have led to some really unusual flooding? Have we had some droughts that have had a very negative impact on our local economy? Just talk about what's happened in your community and you'll get a very clear picture with only a very short discussion of the ways that you're already being affected by weather and climate today. And 99 times out of 100, those are pretty much the ways that climate change is gonna affect you in the future, except worse. Thank you. I have a Jim Hansen question for you. Uh, Jim Hansen is preparing a report, Acceleration of Global Warning, Warming, about the greenhouse gas radiant forcing graph he circulated in late 2017. What is behind this increase in greenhouse gases? Um, there, okay. Uh, so I would actually recommend reading chapter four of the science report that I refer to. I actually wrote that. Um, and it is very specifically about greenhouse gas emissions, concentrations, and their radiative forcing in the atmosphere, and then how that connects to temperature. So it's kind of like a chain of dominoes. We produce these gases by burning fossil fuels and also through deforestation. And then these gases build up in the atmosphere, that's the concentration. And then in the atmosphere, they absorb the heat's energy and keep it from escaping to space. That's the radiative forcing. And then because they absorb the, the, the Earth's energy, they would otherwise escape to space, then they increase global temperature. So that's kind of the connection between emissions and global temperature. Now, here's the thing, and this is, this is what Jim does so effectively. He pushes the envelope on the uncertainty because as far back as we can go in the history of the earth, we cannot find any time when this much carbon dioxide was going into the atmosphere this fast. We can find times when it was warmer back in the dinosaur times, but we can never find a time when this much carbon was being shoved into the atmosphere as it is today. And so because of that, there's uncertainty associated with just how the planet's gonna respond. We give our best guesses based on the latest physics of, you know, if we produce this much, this is what's gonna happen. But what we've seen happening over the last 20 years is that a lot of our predictions of if we do this, this is what's gonna happen have been a bit on the low side. And what Jim does in the scientific community is he's constantly pushing people to consider the risks of the higher side. And because of that, I think he, he does a very useful service to the community. Thank you, thank you. I have one last, it's actually not a question. Um, it's a, um, a statement from one of our participants and I think he represents everybody today um, saying he feels honored to have experienced mm -hmm. your presentation. And I too feel very honored and I'm sure that everyone got a lot out of your presentation and we'll be able to watch it um, through, the, um, through the recording, which we'll send out to people tomorrow. So I would like to thank you so much for participating in this and for sharing your wisdom and your thoughts with us. And um, we hope as elders that we can make a difference. Mm -hmm. So thank you. You can, thank you.
Thank you, everybody, and good night. And this is our last webinar. Um, hopefully, we will do some more next spring. And if you've enjoyed it, please fill out the, um, or if you, even if you haven't enjoyed them, please fill out the survey and let us know your thoughts and how we can improve upon them in the future. And also um, enjoy the recordings so you can go back and really dig into the slides that have been presented tonight. So thank you so much, everybody, and have a great night. I'll just add one thing, make sure you join us for the TN Talk on the 27th, um, on Monday the 27th, and the link will be included in your email.